Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Today we're going to look at a story in the book of Luke. The book of Luke. The story is called The Woman with the Spirit of Infirmity. Spirit of Infirmity. The book of Luke is the third book of the Bible in the New Testament. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke. So if you go to the New Testament, want to find out where this is, it's the third book. Luke is a physician. He's a doctor. So he's very clinical. He's very analytical in what he says. And if you look at Luke's writings versus Mark's writings versus Matthew's writings, they look a little bit different. He gives a little bit more detail because he's like a doctor. He's like a scholar. The book of Luke is the only New Testament book written by a Gentile. A Gentile. Luke being a Gentile. So some fun facts about him. And Luke recounts this story of Jesus and he says this. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. We're going to get into that in a moment. But there's a lot of controversy right now in the church world over the Sabbath. I mean, even my Bible school, I had to write a paper on the Sabbath. And are we keeping the Sabbath? And are we keeping it holy? And why aren't we doing church on Saturday and not on Sunday? And I'll just tell you this, we had Saturday night church and I hated it. I did. I had no life. I had no life. We'd go to a barbecue and we had to be done by 3 o'clock because we had to get ready to get to church. And it really wasn't, for us, it didn't really suit what we were doing on Sunday. It didn't match. Anyway, we're going to get to the Sabbath. Verse 11, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. It's right back here. How long did she have it? 18 years! She had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bent over and, and could no way raise herself up. And for the Bible to kind of point this out, it wasn't that she was just a little bent over. No. It wasn't that she was just walking like this. When the scripture points something out like this, she was very deformed, very deformed. We don't know which way she was bent over either. We don't know if it was forward, sideways, backwards, but in any case, she was in a position in which was not a normal bending position, and she was stuck this way. But when Jesus saw her, she call, he called her to him. He laid his hands on her, he said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmities. And immediately, she was made straight and glorified God. But the pastor of the church answered with indignation because Jesus healed her on the Sabbath day. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. What a jerk. Like, seriously, what a jerk. Like, he just saw a miracle and he said, no, nah, but why'd you do it on Sunday? Why'd you do it on Saturday? Just do that kind of work on Monday. Yo, Jesus gets ticked off, man. The Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite! Yo, I don't know about you, but if someone calls me a hypocrite, that's like we're going to fight. We're going to fight. We're going to throw down. That, that's like a harsh one. Hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox and donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being the daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all the adversaries were put to shame, and the multitude rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. Let's break this down. Let's look at it piece by piece. Ready? The first verse here says this. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. Why was he teaching? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But also, this is the point I was trying to make and I got ahead of myself. In Hosea 4, 6, the Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Do you know what Hosea 4, 6 doesn't say? It doesn't say, for my people are destroyed because of the attack of the devil. 
The Bible doesn't say, my people are destroyed because, the sa- because Satan is strong. The Bible doesn't say, my people are destroyed because of sin. He says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So the best way to avoid dis- destruction is to what? Yeah. No more. No more. Get knowledge. Get knowledge. Do you know what I heard? I heard a startling statistic that 80% of people never read a book after college. After college. And then we wonder why things in our lives fall apart. How come I don't know anything about my finances? Do you know that, the, that money does not work the way it did 20 years ago? Money does not work the same way anymore. It just does not. The way that we were raised to look at money and view money 20 years ago is completely different today. Completely different. But how do you know that if you don't get more education? If you don't get more knowledge? He says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If you knew more about God's goodness and God's mercy, the devil's attempts to attack you would be overridden by your knowledge of God. We didn't get that. We didn't get that because that would have been a bigger like, wow, moment, right? If we knew more about God, we knew more about our rights, we knew more about our own personal power, then when the devil comes tempting us, we would know that this is not of God. But we don't know that. We don't know that. Because we hear really dumb teachings. I'm going to get into it now. I'm going to lose some people on this one. Because we hear dumb teachings that God is in control of everything. I know. I know it. I know it. I know it. Because they're on TV saying it. God is not in control of the cheeseburger you're going to eat at lunch today. He's not in control of that. He's not making you do that. Some of you ate breakfast before church. Some of you are not breakfast people. God's not in control of that. God's not in control of whether you put leaded or unleaded gas in your car. He's not in control of whether you put 87 or 93. You chose that. God is not in control of a storm that happened that flooded out New Jersey. God was not in control of that. Satan is the God of this world. The world is in a fallen state. There is good and there is evil. What i got to get you to know today as a preacher proclaiming the good news, God is good all the time even when things are bad. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, the Bible says. But there is an enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But if you don't know that, you don't know to say, no, you may not. No, you may not devour me. No, you may not bring this. Listen, if you thought God was in control of everything, then when you got sick, then God was in control of that. And then when you got sick, you went and took medicine. If you went and took medicine, then you're going against God. And we just know that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any rational sense. God didn't make you sick to teach you a lesson, just like you wouldn't put your kid's hand on a frying pan to teach them it's hot. It's asinine. That's not a good father. And this room is full of good fathers today. Good fathers. The best way To overcome the attack of the enemy is to know more about who God is and his nature. If you're in the middle of a storm and you've done all to stand and you don't know what else to do, learn more. (laughs) I don't know what else to do. Then you need to learn more. See, but that takes a little bit of work, doesn't it? And we want to fast forward that part. We want, I, don't, I don't want to know, just fix it for me. I don't need to know that. I don't want to fill my brain with all that stuff. Just get me to the end. Get me to the fixed part. Get me to the okay part. But 
That's why he's saying you're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We need to know more about the goodness of God. Verse 11, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over and then could no way raise herself. The Bible uses this word spirit of infirmity and says that it has attached itself to her body and that she has been in this condition for 18 years. I want to point something out. Jesus was in no way phased by the length of her infirmity. He wasn't like, wait, how long have you had this? 18, oh, well, yeah. no, never mind. I mean, because if it was like two weeks, okay, then maybe I could do something about it. But 18 years, I think what happens to us is that over time, we get used to things, and we allow them to remain in our body, and in fact, we play with them and we name them. Two weeks ago, if you were here two weeks ago, I started this series. I had to actually sit on a stool because I couldn't stand up because I had vertigo. Well, come to find out, I've got allergies. These allergies are bad this year, whatever. And I got fluid in my ears from the allergies, and it made me dizzy and whatever else. But you know what those allergies are not? They are not my allergies. My allergies are flaring up. My bad leg. Got this bad leg, been bad for 18 years. I got a bad leg, got a bad back, got a bad. It ain't mine. That ain't mine. I'm not going to get used to this thing and, and, and name it. Oh, uh, you know, I got this little growth on the back. Of, I got Betty, a little Betty, Betty bump on the back of my leg. That ain't mine. I'm not going to own that thing. I'm not going to get used to it and play around with it. <laughs> Don't get used to something because it's plagued you for a long time. My skin problem, my family's heart disease, you know, my family history. You know, they got diabetes in my family. No, they got a cookbook in your family. Come on, they got a cookbook. Change your cookbook, change your diabetes. All right. If you claim something as yours, it's yours. And it's not. It's the enemy. It's the adversary. It's the spirit of infirmity. And here's the, here's the truth. She was probably in that church for 25 years. You know what I'm saying? And 18 of them, she'd been broke. Body broke. 18 years, she'd been in the same church and not healed. She came to church even though she didn't feel like it. Even when there were days that she probably couldn't pick herself up to get there. Probably had somebody carry her. Body hurting. But she put herself in a position and in a place to be healed. She knew that if there was a place that she could get help, it would be there. And Jesus says, she's come here, and she has a covenant right as an heir of Abraham. Mm. This takes us to this point, because she's a covenant child, which kind of means she's born again. So then, can a born-again Christian be demon-possessed? Can a born-again Christian be demon possessed. Well, let's just first look at this word possessed. In New York, and I think it's pretty much every other state, possession is nine tenths of the law, right? Possession means to be owned. It is if I own this. And you cannot be owned by the devil and owned by God at the same time. <laughs> cannot, right? You cannot be a child of God and a child of Satan at the same time. You can be a child of God who acts like Satan. I know some church people who get a little nasty, <laughs> embarrassing, right? But you cannot be owned. You cannot be possessed by both God and Satan. And then we have to understand this. Who are you? Are you your body or are you your spirit? Well, you are a spirit. You have a soul, a mind, will, and emotions, and you live in a body. Okay? So if you purchase a house... And the house inspector comes and says, hey, you got termites in this house. Does that mean that the termites are in you? No, they're in the house. They're attached to the house. And so you get in there and you get those things out. Get them out of the house. So we believe here at Family Church, and I'm sure this could be controversial, we believe here at Family Church that a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. 
They can be demonically oppressed. They can be impressed, which means something is impressing upon them to affect their body. But the word possessed, no, they cannot be. What I see a lot of things happen is I see people have emotional breakdowns. That can look pretty scary. That can look pretty demonic when someone has an emotional release and they go a little buck wild. But no, we do not believe that a born-again Christian can be demon-possessed. And we do look to do some sermons in the future, one on the end times and one on demonology. But I don't really have the time to go into that today, okay? Luke 13, 12. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to himself and he said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Jesus has come to me. And that wasn't really convenient. Because we don't know the posture in which she was in. We don't know if she was sitting down. We don't know if she was standing up. But we know that she has to take an action, a movement toward God, towards Jesus in order to be healed. It wasn't convenient. She's bowed over. Her body crippled. And I want to tell you this today. Jesus is calling maybe somebody watching online and and, and something's happened in your life, and you're like, I couldn't go back to church. I'm telling you today, Jesus is calling to all of the, he's calling all the hurting to himself. He's calling the hurting to himself. At some place in all of our lives, there's been a hurt. There's been a wound. And I, I love talking to dads, because most dads got some calluses on their hands. Got some scars on their hands. Right, even a chef probably got a few scars from moving the knives. And those scars are kind of battle wounds, they're kind of a history story. Things you've been through, things you've done, work that's been accomplished. You got, got a scar, you got a, you got a callus there from that. And, and getting those things hurt, man. And, and, and that scar and that callus has a story behind it. And sometimes in our lives, in female lives as well, I mean, again, to take it for everybody. Those wounds and those scars and those hurts and those pains a lot of times make us feel like we need to distance ourselves from God. He'd be so disappointed in me. Yet he's saying, come to me. Come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and need rest. And we're going to look at that. That's what the Sabbath really was supposed to be, was rest. He says, you're saying, I can't do work. Healing somebody, like, Jesus was actually trying to say this, hey, doing a healing ain't no work. That ain't no work. It ain't nothing to do that. Because really the Sabbath is rest. My question to you is this, how bad do we really want the goodness of God? Because I've seen it in church at large, like there's a lot of people who want to make it so difficult for everybody else. We make getting to God so difficult for everybody else but us. Right? Come on. Can, can we just be honest for a minute? Like, you're driving down the highway, and someone goes flying past you. And you think to yourself, man, where's a cop when you need one? <laughs> but you're speeding too. You ain't going as fast as them. Now, a few minutes later, a few minutes later, you ain't thinking about it, but a cop's behind you, turns his lights on. Jesus, 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 mercy, mercy, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And he's looking, looking at the rear view, back, Jesus, 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 Jesus. But then he goes around you and goes after that guy. You're like, oh, thank God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank God. Then you get up to the guy up the road. It's that same guy. You're like, yeah, good for him. You schizophrenic. <laughs> How messed up are we, right? We're messed up. And we do the same thing spiritually. Spiritually. You ate three pieces of cheesecake. But then you're going to judge somebody who sins differently than you. Get them, God. They can't come to this church. They're going to sit next to me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear? Did you hear about some? Did you hear about that? Did you see? Did you see what they did? Yeah. I love you, Lord. Yeah. 
man, you know, I found out a lot of times, man, the people who shout the loudest in church, hey, man, hallelujah, some of the nastiest people out in the community. Some of the nastiest attitudes and all that. I'm like, how, how does this make sense? And this is what we're seeing here. This is what we're seeing in the scripture. We got this priest who's like negating the work of Jesus, but Jesus, he's calling out. He's not speaking what he saw. He's speaking what should be. Yes, what I see is a crippled individual in front of me, but what should be, because you're a child of God, a seed of Abraham, you should be upright and healed. Too many of us keep calling what we see instead of what should be. We keep talking about the problems that we see, and we're not quoting scripture about what things should be. It would be great if there would be some Christians that would get off the soapbox and get on their knees. That would be awesome. And then I just want to throw something else out. Can I throw something else out? It's just wild, the church taking up certain agendas and fighting certain things that Jude and Revelation says are going to happen. So we're like literally wasting our time fighting causes that the Bible says is going to happen. Are we trying to undo what God said? Are we trying to slow down the process? I'm just unsure sometimes. Here's the preacher asking questions to make you think. Okay? We're going to get back to teaching. Jesus says, as a covenant heir of Abraham, she should not be this way. As a child of God in this generation, there are certain things that should not be attached to your body, that we should be healed from. You see, Jesus didn't even point out the spirit. The scripture says there was a spirit of infirmity, but Jesus didn't even speak to it. He pointed out her covenant. He said, this is a child of Abraham, be loosed. Child of Abraham, be loosed. And every believer has the same right. Verse 13, he said that he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. If you study out scripture in healings, Jesus didn't always lay hands. Sometimes he sent his word. Sometimes he spoke. My favorite is when Jesus was like, oh, spit in some mud and slapped it in this dude's eye. <laughs> I want to do that one day so bad. I want someone to come back, y'all, I need to be healed. Hold on. <laughs> the Bible says she was made straight, she was healed, she glorified God. When you get something from God, glorify him. Glorify him. Amen. But check this out, verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue answered them in, with indignation. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. Yo, he's salty for the wrong reason. He's upset because Jesus did something he could never do. Jesus did something in his own house that he looked at for 18 years and did nothing about. <laughs> In his response, the ruler was saying that the healing that God did wasn't holy enough to be done on a holy day. Oh. So let's talk about the Sabbath day for a second. God, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's a command. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Commandments aren't lifted. Ten commandments aren't lifted. Ten commandments are fulfilled in Christ. We still, they still apply. They're still good, right? There is one God, and we shall worship him only. Do not worship any other gods but the God, Jehovah God. Yes? These are still good. Do not, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit murder. All great things. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. But there, there, there comes this fight. There's this debate. Now, I'll tell you, I've gotten to some pretty worded debates on social media about the Sabbath day. And if anybody ever attacks you because we in America go to church on Sunday and not Saturday... I'm going to give you a little tool to shut them up. Ready? I'm not saying go looking for a fight. <laughs> Don't pick the fight. 
I'm just saying you can end the fight. My daddy always said that. Son, don't start no fight, but you better finish it. I was like, well, I ain't even going to wait to get hit then. I'm just going to start and finish it. <laughs> Colossians 2.16, ready? Therefore, do not let anyone judge you. We just got to start right there. You just stop right there. Don't let anybody judge you. Don't let anybody judge you. Do you know why we let people judge us? Because we believe the crap about ourselves. We allow, we allow ourselves to be diminished to the choices of our past. The choices of our past do not define us. Do not let anyone judge you. No one gets to stand in that position over you. Don't let anybody judge you for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or in regard to religious festivals, the new, the new moon celebration, or the Sabbath day. Don't let anybody judge you what day of the week you go to church. Don't let anybody judge you on what you do on your Sabbath day. Watch this. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The reality of all the things that the law was is found in Christ. The law showed us that we could not, in and of ourselves, remember the Sabbath day fully and keep it holy fully. It was to point to Christ, that we are to rest in his finished work. That's what the Sabbath is. Resting in his finished work. Verse 15, I love this part. Now, Jesus gets heated. Then the Lord said, you hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? What did Jesus actually do for this woman? Loosed her from a spirit of infirmity. He says, oh, so it's okay to loose a donkey, but it ain't okay to loose a human from a demon. He's like, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. Some, some believe that Jesus maybe saw the guy, the, the, the instructor, the, the leader, the ruler, take his donkey to feed it at, on a Sabbath day. And he says, you, you're going to do work too. And I'm just telling you that this work that I've done is less work than your work. You're going to make sure that your animal gets water but you're not going to make sure that this human being gets the help that they need because it's the Sabbath? Huh. Jesus calls him a hypocrite and he says, So ought not this woman, the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound. When you break down the word Satan, the word Satan can be translated to mean a slanderer, an accuser, one who obstructs or opposes. So let's look at this in the next two minutes. He says, Satan has bound him, Satan has bound her, but she shall be loosed. And then in verse 17, it says, and when he said all these things, all his adversaries. So there's more than one adversary. We know that the word Satan could be adversary, but there's multiple adversaries. Who else stood in the way of this woman's healing? Oh, could it also be the teacher, the ruler, who is standing in judgment? Because remember, if you were deformed at this time, it was because you sinned or a family member sinned. And so everyone else who was holy looked down at you. I don't know what you did. Could you imagine today, every time we had a bad thought? <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Every time we did something that did not fall in line with the perfect letter of God, something from our body happened. Could you imagine? I bet you we all be perfect pretty quick, wouldn't we? <laughs> but it would be so easy. It would be so easy to look at someone who sinned differently, who it was known and visible on them to stand in a place of judgment and not in a place of liberating them from the thing that had them bound. 
I'm going to love you enough to tell you this. I'm going to love you to tell you this. Don't ever judge someone. Don't ever judge someone. Unless you possess the power and the desire to lay hands on them and deliver them from the thing that you judge. If you can't do that or you won't do that, shut your mouth. Because you're an accuser, which means you're Satan. When you're speaking like the devil, when you do that. I didn't say it, the Bible did. We're studying the scripture. We're studying the scripture. The true adversary is the devil, is Satan. And how are we lo loosed from his power or from his attack? By obtaining more knowledge. We need the knowledge that we serve a good God, a compassionate God. He's gentle with us. He's slow with us because we're kind of slow. <laughs> if it's good, it can be from God. If it's bad, it's always from the devil. Nothing bad can ever come from God. If you study philosophy, nothing bad can ever come from God because by nature then God is bad. Can't be. Can't be. God is good all the time even if things are going bad. God still remains good, but there's evil in the land that's trying to take the good away. It's just good theology. Think about that. Study it out. God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And we have access to all sorts of knowledge. But are you accessing it? Are you accessing the knowledge of God? And I want to tell you this today. I want to tell you this today and maybe someone who's watching online. God is not disappointed with you. How silly would that be? Think about it. Come on. Logic. Not even scripture. Logic. God is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is omnipotent and omniscient. He knows all things and he is in all places at all times. Which means he's in the beginning of your life and the end of your life at the same time. That he sees the beginning of existence to the end of existence at the same time. Yes, I'm not trying to like get weird, but that's God. He knows all these things. He knows every decision you're ever going to make before your life began. How foolish would it be that he's disappointed in you when you do the thing that he knew you were going to do? And you do the thing that he already forgave you for doing. <laughs> he didn't forgive you when you remembered to ask for forgiveness. He forgave you when you accepted Jesus Christ. <laughs> he pre-forgave he pre you before you ever did it. That's the power of the cross. That's the power of his blood. Not the power of your ability to ask for forgiveness. If it was left up to you in your power to ask for forgiveness, then God could forgive you, you're screwed. You're done. Because you're not going to remember, nor do you know every time you miss the mark. There are times that I'll be working outside and uh, I'm given a sandwich to eat for lunch. I look at my hands, my hands look all right. I could just eat the sandwich. Eh, I'm going to go wash my hands. Spray a little soap on my hands, start rubbing them together, and I thought my hands were clean. But when I add a little soap to it and do a little scrubbing, wow, they were dirtier than I thought. There was dirt there, but I couldn't see it. And so it is in our lives. Like, if you leave it up to you to remember everything and to know everything that is not God's perfect will... You're going to fail. You're going to falter. But if you rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ, say, Jesus, I surrender to you. 
I give my life to you. I cannot in and of myself do everything that, you ex- that, that, the, that the law expected of me, but I could serve you. I could put my eyes on Jesus. I could have a Savior. I could have a Lord. Guide me, lead me, direct me. Ah, I'm forgiven. I can rest in that. That's the good news of the gospel. This lady, in one moment, in one touch of God, 18 years of pain is gone. 18 years of pain with one touch from the Lord. I just wondered today, would you come to Christ? Maybe there's someone in here who you once knew the knowledge of God. You once were a believer and man, lately life, society, things, it just kind of made it so difficult to think that God is even good. Could you silence the media? Could you silence what other people are saying? What confirms in you? Is God good? Or is God not good? You know, maybe a bad image of a father who wasn't such a good father on earth could give a bad picture of who God is in heaven. But he's not your father that way. He's not moved by emotion. He's not moved by your deeds or your actions. He's moved by the son's obedience. Jesus Christ, because he was obedient to death, even the death of the cross, that moves him to have compassion and mercy and grace to all of us. And if you've never come to him, if you've never come to him, maybe it's been a long time since you came home to Christ. Maybe today's the day to get up in our spiritually crippled condition and make our way to Jesus. If you're here today or watching online, you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Would you pray this with me? And because we love you here at Family Church, we pray it together out loud. It goes this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.